I lived with my dad when I was a teenager, and on St. Patrick's Day one year, he left me alone in the house to go drinking all night. I was pretty used to being home alone when he was at work or partying, so I didn't think anything of it. If I made any plans for the holiday, I would have easily snuck out of the house, but nothing was really going on for me that year, so I stayed in and tried to relax. While I was brushing my teeth, I heard someone knocking on the front door. I walked downstairs with my toothbrush still in my mouth and checked it out, but nobody was there. I opened the door and nobody was there. I figured it was just some ding-dong ditchers. A few minutes later, a storm came through and started raining on the neighborhood pretty heavily, so I was happy to assume to that there were no more kids running around and ringing people's doorbells for kicks. I decided to watch a movie in the dark, so I sat down on the couch next to the window. After about an hour, I heard the same knocking sound come from the front door again. This time, I grabbed my dad's flashlight and shined it out into the rain to look for the culprit. However, I still didn't see anyone. I started to get paranoid, so I went around the house making sure all the windows and doors were locked. Once I was sure the house was secure, I finished the movie I was watching, then scrolled on my phone for a few hours until I eventually passed out. What the hell was that? Ah! Oh! Enough! I want your gold! No way! Get out of here! I'm not letting you in my house! <laughs> Said, let me in, damn it! I'm getting in there no matter what you do, you bitch! Open the door and relinquish your gold! Now! Leave me alone or I'm calling the cops! <laughs> <laughs> Where are you hiding it? I don't have any gold! My dad just uses his credit card! Well then, where's he? Please, you have to believe me! I don't have any gold! Only the gold is my Honey Nut Cheerios, and I ain't talking cereal! Just, just let me go, you little insect! Don't lie to a leprechaun! <laughs> Please, please don't hurt me! Well, I wouldn't have to now, would I? If you were wearing any green! I'm not going out like this! I ain't dying to a man with short man syndrome! I'll rip your head off for saying that! Somebody help me! You're lucky ripping your head off your shoulders wouldn't be as satisfying as a fresh pot of gold! Where is it? Where's the gold? A house like this can't be cheap! I know you're rich, so where's your stash? You've reached 911. Please describe the nature of your emergency. There's a little person in my house. A leprechaun. A leprechaun? Are you serious? Yes! You got to be kidding me! There's not a single flake! I didn't realize I was breaking into a broke person's house! Is that his voice I'm hearing? Yes! Who in the hell are you talking to? The police! I hope you know they're on their way! Sir, please don't antagonize the intruder. Give me that! Hello? Who's this? Ooh, a lady! Hey, you wanna ride on my rainbow till you get my pot of gold? <laughs> Freaking slut hung up on me! Please, just get out of my house! Fine, but I'm taking this! It would be a waste of time if I left empty-handed! Happy St. Patrick's Day, loser! <laughs> oh, oh, hi. What's this? Nobody's gonna believe me. A freaking leprechaun? <laughs> <laughs> this story was inspired by an incident that happened in 2018. It was alleged the man dressed as a leprechaun would go around taunting his neighbors in a bizarre outburst during St. Patrick's Day. A 61-year-old man named Christopher Blackshaw would go around staring through the windows of multiple homes around the neighborhood and would repeatedly make V-signs at them. 
Blackshaw would eventually get caught and plead guilty to behaving in a threatening or abusive manner, likely to cause a reasonable person fear or alarm. He admitted to staring at the multiple occupants and making offensive gestures at them, all well dressed in the distinctive green outfit. Blackshaw claimed in his defense that he committed the offenses because his neighbors had been deliberately pointing a strong flashlight at him, trying to induce an epileptic fit. He told Livingston J.P. Court in a letter that his neighbors were aware that he suffered from the common neurological condition, which can spark repeated seizures. The man was then fined by the court since. My friends and I never missed a St. Paddy's Day. It was always one of our favorite days of the year. We'd spent the whole night out at bars, drinking and partying until we were completely wasted. It had been a tradition since we were all in college together. Then, one year, that all changed. When St. Paddy's Day arrived, Jess, Riley, and I met up early on in the night and headed over to a bar. In the past, we had gone to some crazy spots around town where people went pretty wild. But now that we were all in our 30s, we preferred to go to this one lounge bar that we liked. It tended to have a more mature crowd than other places, which meant that we didn't have to feel like we were surrounded by teenagers the entire night. Of course, just because we wanted a more mature crowd didn't mean we weren't ready to party. As soon as we got there, the three of us started going at it hard. Most of the time, we all had to be responsible enough to make sure that we didn't go too far. But on St. Paddy's Day, we threw all of that out the window. It was the one night of the year that I often didn't remember everything that happened the next day. When we were all good and wasted, we headed out onto the dance floor. That's when we really started enjoying ourselves. It was already feeling like the perfect night. The music was great, the crowd wasn't too rowdy, and I was drunk enough that I could make a fool of myself and not care. This had been going on for a while, when I suddenly noticed Riley getting hit on across the room. The first thing I noticed was that she looked really uncomfortable. Then I saw the guy and immediately understood why. He was this creepy, slender guy, Latino, about average height, and a little older. Everything about him made him look like a douche. His face was the creepiest thing about him, though. He just kind of looked sinister. I guess Riley rejected him, though, because the next thing I knew, she was walking over to me and Jess to dance. The whole situation looked incredibly awkward, and as I looked back at the guy, he seemed upset. He was staring at Riley intensely from across the room, watching her every move. It was super creepy. The bar wasn't packed either since it was more of a lounge, so it made things even more awkward. We couldn't just disappear in the crowd and avoid the man. No matter where we sat or danced, he could always still see us. The man continued to stand at the bar area like a creep and stare at us, even after it had been over an hour since Riley had left him there. I had thought that he would have moved on to some other girl after a few minutes, but he didn't seem to be able to get over her. The guy had to be some sort of psycho to still be watching her this much later. He started to make me feel very uneasy. What made it worse was how he just stood by the bar, so every time that we went up to buy more drinks we would encounter him. There was no way around it. Jess and I tried to get Riley to stop going up there, but she wouldn't listen to us. There's no way I'm letting that creep ruin my night. So she continued to run into the man every time she went up to the bar. Each time that she did, he would hit on her again. No matter how many times that she said no, he just couldn't take the hint. The guy was crazy. Riley somehow didn't seem to be too bothered by it though, so I tried to put it out of my mind and enjoy the night. Then, at one point, Riley went for another drink, and all of a sudden, the man started screaming at her. I was across the room when I heard it happen, and I didn't know what to do at first. Then I saw the man grab her wrist and try to pull her toward him. Why are you protecting me, you stupid bitch? Women like you need to be humbled! Ah! Let me go, you psycho bastard! I ran off the dance floor to come to Riley's aid and yelled at the man to let her go. Then, out of nowhere, the man let go of Riley's wrist and came charging at me. Ah! And he looked like he was trying to strangle me. I kicked and punched at him repeatedly, but I was barely able to fight him off. The guy was absolutely insane. Eventually, the staff were able to grab the man and escort him out of the bar. My friends and I were shaken up, but we were glad that the man was finally gone. We tried to drink the night away and still have a great St. Paddy's Day, but it was hard to get back into it after that terrifying ordeal. After a few more hours, we left the bar and walked to our respective cars to head home. The next day, 
I woke up with a terrible hangover. I texted Jess and Riley to see how they were feeling. Jess answered right away, but Riley didn't respond. I got a little worried after a few hours and tried to give her a call, but she didn't answer. And actually, from that point, I never heard from her again. Later that day, I found out that Riley's body had been discovered in an alleyway. It was later revealed that the same guy from the bar had kidnapped her on her way home and executed her shortly after. Police were able to use phone data to indicate that the man had been in the same room as Riley between 2 and 3 a.m. During that time, they received a 911 call from Riley's phone, but the call was immediately disconnected. Authorities tried to return her call, but the attempts were unsuccessful. Shortly after, her phone reportedly dropped off the network. The man has been arrested since. I'll never forget that night, though. And I'll never forgive that man for taking my friend away from me. The most horrible thing is that Riley left behind three sons. This story was inspired by a case regarding a 34-year-old Colorado missing mom of three who went missing from a bar more than four years ago. The woman was named Rita Gutierrez Garcia, whose remains were discovered in an alley behind a bar on March 18, 2018, around 2.30 a.m. Gutierrez Garcia and her friends have been celebrating St. Patrick's Day the night leading into her early morning disappearance. Juan Figueroa Jr., 33, was identified as a possible suspect early on in the case, who pled guilty to the kidnapping and slaying of Gutierrez Garcia. According to court documents, Gutierrez Garcia and Figueroa had briefly interacted with each other at a bar shortly before she went missing. Phone tower data indicated the location of Gutierrez Garcia's phone matched the location in which Figueroa's car traveled between 2.30 a.m. and 3.10 a.m. During that time frame, police said they received a 911 hang-up call from the victim's phone. Two attempts to return Gutierrez Garcia's call were unsuccessful. Shortly after, her phone reportedly dropped off the network. On March 20, 2018, Figueroa fled the state of Colorado for Mexico and then attempted to cross back into the U.S. on March 27, 2018, but was arrested for the attempted assault of another woman. He was found guilty and is currently serving a 93 years to life sentence. That St. Patrick's Day just happened to be a Saturday. I had plans to go to the lake with my friends, Kylie and Monica. The community dock was pretty popular. Lots of people went swimming in the lake or rented canoes from the boathouse. My mother dropped me off as usual. To get there, you only had to drive a mile or two through woods to a parking lot. And after that, unless you were hauling a boat, it was a short walk down a trail to the water. She told me to meet her back there by three o'clock, which gave me and my friends plenty of time to hang out. We managed to get one of the last canoes from the boathouse and paddled out away from the shore. That's when my friend Kylie pulled a bottle of liquor out of her bag that she'd stolen from her parents. She pressured me and Monica to drink with her because it was St. Patrick's Day, but we were really scared of getting caught by our parents or somebody passing by us on another boat. We were far from old enough to drink, and it was a small town, so almost everybody knew everybody. However, after a little convincing, it seemed like it would be perfectly fine to sneak a little bit here and there while we were out in the water. After all, who would be able to tell what we were doing from the shore? And it wasn't like a boat could sneak up on us. We started drinking slowly, passing it amongst each other. It didn't take long for the liquor to start going down easier and easier. And pretty soon we were snatching the bottle out of each other's hands to take longer and longer chugs. Three or four hours later, the bottle was empty. We tossed it into the lake to get rid of the evidence, but there was no hiding how drunk we were. We got so rowdy that we almost tipped the boat a few times, and I'm sure everyone could hear us shouting and screaming at each other like a bunch of hooligans. Somehow though, none of us got nauseous from the boat rocking around in the water. The only thing that got us heading back to the shore was when I looked at my watch and realized it was already almost three o'clock. I forced Kylie and Monica to start paddling toward land with me, but they were so wasted that they barely cared about my curfew. I was clenching my teeth the whole time, nervous about my mom asking why I was late to meet her at the car. In my mind, if I was late by just a couple of minutes, it guaranteed that she would find out I had been drinking. When we got back to land and put the canoe away in the boathouse, I knew I only had a few minutes until three. Unfortunately, Kylie and Monica badly needed to use the bathroom. I didn't want to walk back alone, so I waited outside for a minute or two. But when it became obvious that they would take longer than I could spare, I decided to meet up with them later and started heading back on my own. It was a short walk through the woods. It should have only taken a few minutes, and if I ever saw anybody else on the trail, 
It was usually just another person heading to or from the lake. That day was different though. I don't know if it was just because it was St. Patrick's Day, or if it was karma for drinking when I knew I wasn't supposed to. But halfway back to the parking lot, I saw something I never could have expected. There was a short man standing in the middle of the path. He was dressed as a leprechaun, but he was so tiny and short that he actually could have been one. He was facing me, but he wasn't going anywhere. All he did was look at the ground and twitch every few seconds. <laughs> I'd never seen anything so creepy in my life. I should have known better and turned around, but the alcohol made me braver than I should have been. I decided to keep going and walk around him. It seemed like he was in some kind of trance, so I thought I could just slip by without him even noticing I was there. I tried to tread quietly, and for a moment it seemed like it would work. Then, without any warning, the most horrible and shocking possible thing happened that would completely change my life. It was 30 years ago, on this day, that I dropped my daughter off at the lake so she could be with her friends. I left for just a few hours to take care of some errands. I thought she would be safe as long as it was bright and sunny out, but when I got back at 3 o'clock, she wasn't there. I waited, hoping she was just running a few minutes late, but when I saw her friends come back without her, I knew something was wrong. They said the last time they saw her was when they went into the bathroom after getting back from the lake. They said she was going to wait outside since she didn't have to go, but then she left by herself without saying anything. They weren't worried about her because they thought I had already picked her up, until they realized I was still looking for her. So I immediately called the police and started searching for her. After several horrible hours of looking, my worst fears were realized. Her body was found just a few yards from the trail where she disappeared. Ever since then, even after all the investigations, the suspects, the tests, nobody has been held responsible. Nobody knows what happened to her or who could have done it. At this point, I have to accept the fact that it might have been someone or something completely undetectable. This story was inspired by a horrific St. Patrick's Day incident regarding a young female named Rachel. On March 17, 1990, Rachel and her friends spent the day boating. But around 2.45 p.m., Rachel got nervous about getting back to shore in time to meet her mother at 3 p.m. So after the boat docked, Rachel, accompanied by her friends Aaron and Maddie, began to walk the path to Carlin Park where Rachel's mother was waiting. Rachel then took it upon herself to sprint off down the path without them. She unfortunately never made it to the parking lot where her mom was waiting. Rachel's mother would later alert authorities, unable to find her at home or at the park. Police then launched a search that involved 100 deputies, two boats, one helicopter, eight mounted deputies, and three canine units. After hours of searching, they found her remains in a wooded area of Carlin Park. Authorities then questioned more than 50 homeless men who were known to have frequented the wooded area, but the search led to nowhere. For 31 years, suspects have come and gone, but no one has been arrested. 